Hello, my name is Vince Cerf. I'm Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google. I'd like to spend uh, a little bit of time talking to you about hypertext, at least as I see it. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean my definition is definitive, but I think of hypertext as text about which software knows something and is capable of interacting with it, supporting it, presenting it, allowing uh, manipulation of the, of the text. And uh, this is in two contexts. One of them is in the consumption of the text, reading it and, inter uh, and uh, interacting it while consuming it. And the second one is producing it. Uh, and on the production side, uh, I think of hypertext as being uh, more valuable from the standpoint of um, producing it with metadata in mind, with the, the software having some understanding of the structure of the content, as opposed to its format. Uh, a great many word processing systems, text processing systems, focus very heavily on what does it look like when it's printed or presented. And I'd like to argue that uh, the value of hypertext is less in the uh, visual presentation, that has less value in the visual presentation and focus than it does on the ability to interact with the text and to use software to help you consume it, uh, to uh, edit it, to reference it. So uh, let's, let's go down that path for a few minutes anyway. Uh, the, the thing which I find particularly valuable uh, is a software environment in which the focus of attention can be on what is the content and how is it structured? How do the parts of the text relate to each other? And can I move those parts around in order to satisfy some uh, organizational objective? Uh, certainly the, uh, the most visible example uh, of this kind of thinking is Douglas Engelbart's online system demonstrated many years ago. Many of you will have heard of the uh, demo, to, the mother of all demos in 1968, uh, in which the online system was demonstrated live uh, in an audience, before an audience in San Francisco, but running on a machine that was in 30, years, uh, 30, uh, 30 miles to the south of Menlo Park. Uh, the, the notion there uh, is that the system had uh, an understanding of the structure of the text and it allowed fairly gross manipulations of you know, moving large chunks of text around, changing their uh, relationships to each other, their uh, relative uh, presence in a hierarchy, for example, a typical uh, uh, structured document. Uh, in addition to that, of course, there were a lot of other features, including uh, concurrent editing of the document, which was truly astonishing for a 1968 production. Uh, this idea that multiple parties have the ability to interact with the object uh, literally concurrently uh, is extremely attractive because it often allows for rapid production of, of text where agreement has to be achieved among uh, multiple parties who are editing uh, the document. Uh, I think that uh, the other thing which uh, strikes me about consuming uh, the, uh, the content is that uh, the object that you're consuming has the ability to recreate an environment in which there is knowledge about or understanding of structure. So uh, Frode Hedlund, who was uh, really a, a, a disciple of Douglas Engelbart, introduced visual meta as an add-on to PDF formats that would allow uh, the structure of the document and a lot of metadata about it to be captured in a way that, uh, that allowed this uh, structure to be recreated, uh, supporting both further editing and certainly consumption uh, of the document. Uh, I think another area of real interest here is the ability to uh, link to other documents, references, and the like. Now, of course, we have something like that in the World Wide Web. Uh, there are some uh, hazards associated with that particular kind of referencing, in particular if the domain name is no longer supported, somebody forgot to pay the bill, then the URLs that refer to the documents may not resolve. In which case, uh, uniform resource identifiers that are not URLs uh, may turn out to be your friends if they are still resolvable, particularly over long periods of time. Which brings me just to the last point having to do with preservation of digital content. If hypertext is going to be useful to us over a long period of time, we better find ways of 
preserving that digital uh, representation so that it is, uh, recre can be recreated or uh, reused uh, 100 or 200 or 500 years from now. Uh, we have other media that have lasted a long time, not the least of which are stone uh, or clay tablets that have been baked uh, because of an inventory, uh, a, a, uh, sorry, a warehouse, for example, may have burned down and the inventory on the uh, on the clay tablet has actually been baked into almost hard stone. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not everybody uh, can read cuneiform uh, these days, uh, and that's the, not the most flexible of, uh, of instantiations for, uh, for content. Computer-based instantiations are by far the most flexible uh, that have been invented so far, and hence the excitement around hypertext. One small codicil, there was the period of time during 2022 when a number of people uh, were excited about the possibility of projecting hypertext into a three-dimensional environment with you know, headsets looking at a, an extended uh, work area. Uh, I'm personally not yet persuaded that the uh, uh, 3D headsets are uh, adequate to the task. Uh, and so I don't have quite the same enthusiasm that some other people have for it. But I'm super enthusiastic about uh, software that understands content and structure and aids both in production and consumption. So I'll stop there. I hope this may have tickled your imagination a little bit. Uh, and if not, well, you have a few minutes to think about something. Meanwhile, uh, even if we don't get to meet in person, maybe we'll meet each other on the net.